Hi everyone, so my name is Alice Jeffries. I'm the lead tax advisor at the CBI, the Confederation of British Industry, which is a member organization that represents 190,000 businesses across the UK, um, employing about a third of the UK private business workforce. And I'm very pleased to be joined today um, by Dan and Christian uh, to talk about O oh, Tax, Where Art Thou? A world um, changing dramatically in terms of geopolitical shifts, technical innovation and globalisation, and where tax and tax policy sits in the discussions we're having around trade, strategy and sustainability. Um, so I'll let Dan introduce himself first and then go to Christian and we can start the discussion. Hi, I'm Dan Needle. I used to be a practising tax lawyer. I was head of tax at one of the largest law firms in the world in here in the London office. I then retired mostly to spend time with my family, partly to start what I think is the smallest think tank in the UK, Tax Policy Associates. I write and try and persuade and sometimes advise on tax and tax policy. Great. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Christian Hallam. Uh, I work with Oxfam as one of their two tax justice uh, leads, uh, meaning that I basically try to coordinate and follow all the tax justice work uh, that Oxfam does. My main focus is on uh, the tax justice work that we do in Africa, but I also do follow international corporate tax debates and the debate around tax havens and, and more. So excited to be here. Fantastic. Um, thanks both very much. Uh, if people have questions or comments, I understand you can drop those in the chat and we'll take those towards the end of the session. Um, but I think if Dan, let's start with a big fundamental question. What do you think is the biggest tax challenge for businesses and for society today? So there's probably two different challenges we should talk about. One is the challenge of the now, the other is the longer term challenge to do with the international tax system. The challenge for the now is one driven by energy prices and the fact that we as a society are measurably poorer as a result of higher energy prices. And the question for us as a society is who, who, who takes the hit? Is the hit taken by individuals, families and households? Well, I think, I think the answer is it can't be, but can't very much be because people actually couldn't, couldn't afford to do that. Um, I suppose one could superficially say the hit should be taken by government, but, but government is, is really just a way of allocating costs between different stakeholders today or from, from the covering today but being paid by someone else in the future. So, so government is, isn't the answer. The, the, the answer has to be, surprise, surprise, tax. And that tax could be more tax on everyone, probably has to be to a degree, more tax on everyone. It, it could be more tax on business, on capital, and it could be, and to a degree, has already been more tax on energy producers. The one thing it can't be is a perfect tax that redistributes from the winners of the current crisis to the losers, because most of the winners are Saudi Aramco, um, Chinese oil and gas companies, American oil and gas companies who, who we can't tax. So we, we're not able to achieve, let's use the phrase, tax justice here and redistribute from, from the winners to the losers perfectly. But we're going to have to do what we can. And that will mean um, some new taxes and it will probably have an impact on everyone here. So that's the short term challenge, medium term challenge. We can talk a bit more about the long term challenges later, maybe. I'm interested by that idea of um, it being a matter of tax justice and impossible to achieve tax justice. And I wonder if from a UK business perspective, if the result of attempting to achieve something closer to tax justice between individuals and businesses has been actually to achieve tax injustice between UK business and non-UK businesses. If actually all that we've done is try to get money out of people who don't have that much to spare when it's all being made in other jurisdictions. Well, it's not all being made, it's just mostly being made. You know, se se seven of the, of the world's largest energy companies are, are non-European, and that proportion increases as you go outside the top 10. So, uh, yeah, if you, if you had a redistribution which perfectly protected households, but all the cost on business, then that would be unfair to British business because they would be paying disproportionately, and most of the winners outside the UK and outside Europe wouldn't be paying. Um, there, there's going to be unfairness here. It, it can't be helped. Unless we can magically tax Saudi Aramco, that unfairness is baked in. And is there any way to... 
to attribute some additional cost to those profits? Is there a way for non? Um, right. Is, is there a way to tax, to tax Saudi, Saudi Aramco? Um, no, 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 not not really. I mean, yes, you, you could impose a sort of tariff style tax on gas oil coming in from outside the EU, but but the instance of that is going to fall on people paying. In other words, they'll, they'll jack the prices up because it's a, it's a global product. So you're not really going to be taxing them. You're going to be taxing consumers in a, in, in a hidden way. Um, we can't, in reality, tax Saudi Aramco. Right, Christian, would you agree or disagree with that? So I think it's a bit simplistic to, to boil this down to a few companies, foreign companies, um, but I do agree that the crisis right now is very immediately um, uh, one of energy, one of inflation, but also uh, have, uh, we have to recognize that it's also coming after two years already of a pandemic, um, of a, a, a spiking food prices and uh, also a climate crisis on top. So it's a multiple crises. Um, that have been impacting citizens across the world very unequally. Um, and I think what the crisis of the current kind of approach to taxation is that we keep trying what uh, has been the recipe for the last many decades, which is to uh, uh, try to slash tax, uh, tax rates at the top um, while uh, um, kind of... Kind of uh, uh, dismantling progressive taxation, and of course, uh, you in the UK uh, have had uh, some some experiences with that, also with the new uh, government. But uh, it's actually something we see across uh, numerous countries in Oxfam. We just put out a report this week that looked at the last two years what have governments been doing during the COVID pandemic, and what we found was that uh, 143 countries out of 161 froze taxes on the rich and 11 countries even lowered them during the pandemic. And I think that approach is coming to an end. Uh, we have stretched the sort of the social contract to its uh, maximum. And uh, that approach is not working anymore. I think what we need to see is a massive recommitment to progressive taxation. And we can talk about how that uh, what that would look like, it definitely goes beyond trying to tax uh, Saudi Aramco. Uh, it's, a, it's a wider systemic issue where we have to look at the whole palette of uh, progressive taxation, wealth tax, capital gains tax, personal income tax, but also corporate tax, windfall taxes that for decades have been to some extent um, falling. Um, and we have need they? To... Have, have they? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, there have been some interesting uh, publications recently. I mean, uh, you, you have the IMF fiscal monitor from last year, a fair shot, which definitely documents the kind of collapse from 1980 to, to most current years, where the top marginal rate on personal income tax, on dividends, on other taxes that they highlight, uh, they show a very clear falling trend. Um, so this is something we're seeing across a number of countries um, uh, as a very, very real thing. And as I said, we just documented for 161 countries, what have they actually been doing, uh, uh, doing during the pandemic? And we do find uh, numerous instances where governments are still continuing that route. And we believe that that route is not, no longer viable. Uh, of course, what has happened in the UK might be a reminder of that. Uh, but there are numerous examples showing this. Sri Lanka that was uh, pushed into debt default after uh, doing a huge uh, package also of unfinanced tax cuts uh, last, uh, last year. Uh, we're seeing uh, the chief economists from the European Central Bank coming out to say that we do need to tax the rich more uh, in, if we do want to give uh, inflation support to ordinary citizens. Uh, so. I think there is uh, starting to be a shift in thinking and a recognition that the kind of decades of uh, um, trying to improve our economy through tax cuts uh, that predominantly go to the rich uh, or corporations are no longer working and are no longer suitable, especially if we are, want to come through these prices with uh, the social contract intact. So 
We'll come back to that idea of progression in tax systems, because there's differences as well between a top headline rate and where the marginal rate is on that and who that actually then applies to. And the UK, in some measures, has one of the most progressive tax systems in the world because of the exemptions it has in a personal tax system. But when we're talking about business taxation, um, where do you see that going in the longer term? Are we looking at a sort of effective international collaboration and the efforts that have been made on corporation tax over the last several years um, suggest that that's the model that might be working, although it's fragmenting as it comes to its final stages? Or do you think that this isn't something that we're really going to be able to achieve and it's something that countries are going to have to do for themselves? Well, I do, I do think we're at a very critical junction in, in the international corporate tax debate. I mean, after so many years of trying to find a solution through the OECD uh, to watch uh, what is happening now, uh, difficulties in kind of even implementing what was agreed. And as Oxfam, we had very big reservations about the packages that were agreed, the two pillars. And specifically, I think one issue we have to look at is um, to what extent um, the international negotiations reflect uh, all countries' interests or whether they primarily reflect a few countries' interests. And what uh, really um, was a, a big disappointment for Oxfam was the extent to which the OECD two pillar solution did not take into consideration. Uh, the interest of developing countries. Developing countries tried consistently to raise pr uh, progressive and workable solutions for the two pillars. They tried to engage, but they were consistently sidelined in the discussions. And I think we, we have a right, challenge. But, but here's the thing, here's the thing. You need consensus for international tax change. So, um, and look how hard it's been to achieve consensus and even the fairly minimal changes in pillar one and then implementing it's going to be even harder and your solution to that question is, is no no you need something more radical in, involving more people agreeing i, I just don't yeah, see I how it works. works we needed to have a, a more grounded approach that would have seen a, a good number of countries actually feeling like this was a reform that were, worked in their interest what we had instead was to a large degree a few countries that came together if you remember the process leading up to the uh, October meeting uh, in 2021, where the two pillar framework was endorsed, really the critical moment where uh, victory or sort of job done was already announced was actually at the G7 summit in, in, in June of that year, where uh, a few countries came together and more or less uh, decided on the contours of the, of, the, of the two pillars. And I think that approach has really shown uh, that it's not sustainable. Uh, now we have a situation where... Just a where... devil's advocate here, Christian, though. 136 countries did sign up to that agreement in October, and many of those were developing countries, and they did it in a situation where it wasn't necessarily a case of one or the other. It was a case of a, you know, a rising tide could raise all ships. Pillar two includes a mechanism both to tax at a headquartered level and at a local jurisdictional level. So one of the I know one of the biggest gaps for developing countries have been around the fact that they don't tend to have many of the headquarter groups in their area. So we're looking at lower top, top up taxes. A UTPR is one of the solutions to that and it's there in the rules. And, and they did sign up to it. So is it genuinely the view of many of these developing countries that they've signed up to a bad deal because it was the only option on the table? Or is this better than what they're currently dealing with? So two things. First of all, uh, it is not 136 countries. It is, uh, that number includes jurisdictions as well. And actually there's a very good number of countries, primarily developing countries, that were not part of the inclusive framework that negotiated this agreement. Of the developing countries that were part, you still had very big uh, developing countries that ended up not endorsing, Nigeria and Kenya, um, and uh, ATAF that represents the African countries that raised very, very fundamental concerns about the agreement. At the end, uh, I think the Argentine finance minister had a very good uh, formulation. He said it was uh, 
choosing between something bad and something worse. Uh, and I think that's part of why we're seeing the hesitation right now in kind of uh, implementing what was agreed is that uh, for a very big number of countries, this deal is just not all that exciting. Uh, it doesn't look uh, like it really will solve uh, the fundamental issues that the OECD set out um, and still leaves a lot of the, the problems uh, unaddressed. And even to the extent uh, that the complexity in the tax system will increase. So uh, in the end, um, a weak outcome that was unbalanced uh, and unfair, I think is part of what we have to look into why uh, there's not more momentum behind uh, kind of um, uh, joining this agreement. Um, I am traveling to Kenya next week. Uh, I'm hoping to meet with the Kenyan Revenue Authority while I'm there and um, discuss some of their concerns. Uh, late, earlier this year, I was in Nigeria to discuss uh, with the Nigerian Tax Administration also their concerns around this deal. And developing countries have very legitimate uh, and, and, and fundamental concerns about the two pillars. And I think we need to uh, listen to them and understand uh, why it is that they don't feel represented by this deal. Right, but, but again, it comes down to a fundamental point. This is a this is a zero sum game. This is countries acting in their own interests, trusting over revenues. Nigeria is unhappy because it wants to have more rights to tax to tax multinationals. Uh, many of the other members were reluctant to cede those rights. The uh, you, you can't simply say that this deal was insufficient. It's frustrating without answering the question of how you think a more ambitious, less frustrating deal would have achieved consensus. Well, I think we have to look at the global governance of how we negotiate these things. And this is something that we... How? How does changing the governance so, get America to agree that you tax American multinationals more? Well, I think some of the approaches around Pillar 2 are quite interesting because we actually look at creating a framework that doesn't necessarily um, require all countries to um, to kind of you know the the, the kind of point that uh, that the OECD has been making about the, the pillar two that it works even if uh, even if we don't have a, every country implementing first but there's a sort of a built-in mechanism incentive for for implementing it uh, that is a an, an interesting kind of approach to it but there's also the whole basis of how do we uh, negotiate these things and uh, is it done transparently. Uh, is it done in a way that we can actually assess, assess what uh, countries are signing up to? I think one of the major faults of the OECD process, uh, and this is not necessarily on the OECD, but there was a decision not to do uh, thorough impact assessments before asking countries to, to sign up. The impact assessments we had were of uh, designs that were no longer uh, on the table when countries had to endorse. So basically, we had a situation where countries were asked to sign up to something which was actually very unclear what benefits, if any, uh, it would deliver to, to countries. And I think those kind of processes uh, do not result in, in outcomes that have legitimacy, uh, that have buy-in. And I think we're seeing some of those problems right now. And I'm not saying, Dan, that any of this is easy. I think uh, maybe some of the... Um, the good kind of uh, comparisons you can draw is uh, the, the climate negotiations, which have been painstaking, frustrating, and delivered far too little, but at the end of the day has still moved the world in the right direction to some degree. And uh, those kind of international intergovernmental negotiations are never easy, and they're never going to be easy around tax either, because it's about who gets to keep what? It's about the distribution of taxing rights. Um, but I think uh, the climate negotiations is an example that even though it's painstaking and, and can take many years, um, progress is, is possible through these intergovernmental processes, but they need to have transparency, they need to have inclusion, and there needs to be some recognition of fairness in similarity, for, for example, to the differentiated but equal uh, um, uh, responsibilities 
that the WTO uh, operates with. Yeah, I, I don't agree with. So I think I think that's a really helpful. Let me say what I think the problem is and what I think the solution is. So the problem is that the current tax system is deeply embedded in national law in most countries in the world and in international law through tax treaties. And changing it requires consensus. And unlike climate, it's a zero sum game. And you will just not achieve um, anything like consensus among the countries with, with, with the largest uh, c companies headquartered in them for uh, any kind of radical change. But any change which isn't radical, it could be seen by many, certainly including Christian and including me, as insufficient. So what do you do? The answer is to go in a different direction and to reform international tax, one trading block or country at a time, in a way which doesn't require treaty amendments and which isn't, isn't something that has to be done multilaterally by everyone at the same time. There is a proposal out there, um, destination-based cash flow tax, which probably now isn't the time to go into it, but it needs that kind of radical thinking. Unfortunately, Oxfam and the NGOs aren't interested because they didn't invent it, and the EU is still progressing its own version of unitary tax because uh, they think they invented that, uh, and those are blind alleys because, again, they require consensus. It will take something really radical, um, a paradigm shift, to really make progress here. It's interesting to hear you say that you think that radicalism wouldn't work because it would be rejected by the largest economies and then propose something incredibly radical, Dan, just to just to sort of round out how I've understood yes. what you've just said. But let but, me to take this in a radical it's, it's, that doesn't it's, require it's consensus. I think one thing that, that has been forgotten in that picture, perhaps, is, is business behaviour. They are much more mobile than nations. And when you change the entire tax system, as you say, it's potentially not a zero sum game for the individual businesses who might be affected by it. And so you might see movement in their behaviour as a result, whether that's into or out of jurisdictions that have taken a different and radical approach, um, depends on what the impact would be on them, obviously. And, and then all of the other factors they take into account mm -hmm. around regulation and access to finance and um, the sort of general what what is the potential market for them for their business in that area but uh, i think there should be a recognition that the taxpayers themselves have a view when it comes to what is a sensible approach to taxation and the general support for a global minimum tax rate of 15 percent um it is there among our members who are affected by it in large part because it gives mm. them a certain type of stability and certainty that they are going to get the same approach from multiple tax authorities and potentially a greater simplicity in terms of how it applies to their business, which is hugely valuable to them. So there is value in, in the for the taxpayer in having global consensus as well, which I think is one of those things that sometimes gets forgotten when we're talking about it from a sort of nation state perspective. Um, and I wonder when we're talking about some of those taxpayers and this longer term view, if we can move on slightly to financial services um, and where we think uh, their role is in the relationship with um, taxpayers and progression um, progressive taxes over the next few years, particularly given we're coming out of an era of cheap money into one in which you know, governments are looking for sources of revenue, financial services may be about to increase their revenue substantially depending on what happens in, in the financial markets with interest rates. Are we potentially looking at windfall taxes in that direction? Is that the right thing to be doing? And do banks and financial services have a bigger role to play in sort of raising the tax base over the next few years? Dan, I'll start with you. So, Windfall taxes are wonderful things, but dangerous things. They're, a, a proper windfall tax is retrospective. You wait until the windfall has happened, you look back at it, you say, oh, that, that, that was a windfall. Someone made uh, an awful lot of profit and not because of anything they'd done, just because of circumstances. Uh, let's tax it. We're only gonna do it once, it's a one-off tax, we won't repeat it. Um, because it's retrospective, it doesn't distort incentives going forward, as long as people believe you won't do it again. And because it's retrospective, you're certain you're taxing the right thing and people can't avoid it absent a time machine because again, it's retrospective. So that is the kind of windfall tax that works. Carefully designed, retrospective, one-off, won't be repeated. We saw that in the UK with, a, with, with the bank deposit tax in 1981, with, with the utility, uh, the privatized utility tax in 1998. Those were successful taxes. People believed they wouldn't be repeated. They weren't repeated and as a result, they raised money without causing us economic distortions. So those are the kind of models I think we should think about. Yeah, so uh, 
and it's a, I don't know if, if just maybe quickly on that. So uh, as Oxfam, we have been looking at what is happening across the uh, uh, different sectors. And obviously there is a very big interest right now in trying to tax uh, energy companies because there is a very clear um, uh, kind of uh, windfall profit situation happening in, in that sector. But I think it is important to point out that Again, we're not uh, we're not just facing one crisis. We're just coming out of a, of a, of a pandemic. There's a war, also um, there's inflation, uh, um, and and what we have have kind of done is we've looked across uh, a good number of of big companies, uh, around one thousand listed companies, and kind of try to analyze what is happening with uh, profits. Um, uh, over the, the last couple of years. And what we're seeing there is if we kind of uh, define windfall profits uh, in a similar way that what the EU Commission has proposed, um, which is basically looking at the three previous years and then compare with what is happening right now and then saying that if there's more profit than a, a certain percent, then there's windfall profits. Well, if we apply sort of that basic definition then we're seeing windfall profits across numerous sectors. It's not just energy uh, sector. And actually one of the sectors that does stand out is, is the financial sector also. And I think um, it is uh, in principle uh, something that we think would, uh, would, would make a lot of sense to apply it, uh, not on a sector basis, but really across companies and say that any companies across any sector that is profiting uh, from, from crisis and uh, is experiencing windfall profits should be paying a, a windfall tax in this current moment right now. Uh, and that includes the financial sector. And here we're very um, excited about the proposal that the Spanish government has put forth, which uh, does include financial sector. Um, just to just to take Dan's explanation of what a windfall is, though, and what ta windfall taxes should be in in that context, yeah. is are the financial services actually suffering windfalls in that sense? Is this not a, a regular movement in the market? I mean, pre the financial crisis of two thousand and eight, the money that financial services are making right now from from higher interest rates would have been considered perfectly normal if not slightly lower than than average returns so what makes this a windfall in nature rather than a sort of a standard market movement and what makes you think it's going to stop at any point in the near future yeah it's it becomes almost a philosophical discussion at some point i mean it's something that we have also been grappling with a lot um, how do you define uh, the windfall situation. Um, for us, I think it's it's clear uh, when there is a, when there is a link uh, to to the crisis that I've been describing, uh, and you see this uh, bump uh, across multiple uh, companies at one time, indicating that this is not to do with individual uh, performance, but kind of a, an economy wide um, uh, movement. Um, those are some of the things, but I think it is something that we really need to look into. How do we define this and do this in a smart way? And I don't, it's, it's as uh, anything to do with tax, there are never, never any kind of straightforward, simple answers once you start to dig into the details, but I think it's doable. And I think the commission has laid some, some of the groundwork for how to, to, to define this and how to do it. I think the IMF uh, has done excellent work. They just came out with a paper in September that actually looked into some of these issues, including whether or not this should be permanent or one off. And I think there are some interesting discussions in that paper actually uh, that reflect on what you're saying also then to whether or not uh, there's also argument to be made to make this permanent uh, um, and sort of have it uh, as, as, a, as a built in thing that uh, kicks in whenever there is uh, in retrospect uh, have been a, a uh, kind of a, a windfall situation. So effectively yeah, I think we need to be very careful. Cap. Yeah, that, I think that's that's really what this is. Um, I mean, we, we need to be careful that we are only taxing a thing that is an actual windfall. So the obvious example right now are energy companies where um, 
many of them and not generally the retail the retail companies um but the the generators the producers are making super normal profits because of an increase in in prices that they didn't create and that is economic rent and it's um pr pretty standard economic theory that it's economic rent super normal profit that, that we should be taxing identifying it now is a dangerous thing to do because we risk missing the correct period in which we're taxing it, so taxing the wrong people, taxing the wrong time. Um, I shouldn't pick on Oxfam. No, I'm going to pick on Oxfam. So um, during the pandemic, Oxfam proposed a 99% tax on billionaires' gains during, during the pandemic, 99%, um, measuring it from the lowest point in the market. I think it was August 2021 they proposed, but sort of high peak of the market. Um, since then, the market's gone right down again. What do we do? Do, do we refund it? Um, how would that work? But the real answer is, um, no, you, you you picked the wrong target at the wrong time, and you didn't wait and, and look and see whether there had actually been a windfall. So let's not repeat that. Let's, let, let's calmly look at the situation, probably once it starts to normalise, work out where windfalls have been, and then tax them. And let's not create some funny permanent additional tax on, on profits. Let, let's do it in a very clear, principled way and make it a one-off tax so it doesn't affect ongoing incentives. So the we're all... way of looking at what Christian was suggesting is that this is, there appeared to be a sort of motive test in there almost, Christian, of where the source of this profit is coming from. It's coming from a war that the countries who are taxing it consider to be unnecessary and disruptive and morally wrong. Um, we do, in, certainly in the UK, and there are lots of questions around it, have what we would call sin taxes on personal personal taxation you know we try to prevent people from buying or discourage them from buying cigarettes and uh, soft drinks and plastic packaging it is there and plastic packaging is one of the few sort of syntax categories that is charged on business as opposed to well it's usually passed through to consumers um is there a place i may know the answer to what you think on this already dan but is there a place for morality based taxes in business in you know, looking at intent and source of income. Um, and if so, do we think financial services are one of the recipients of these bad profits? Um, well, I, I think if we identify particular behaviours that we don't like and want to stop, then that's, it's actually something that, that you can use to do it. If we identify externalities that aren't being priced in, tax is a great vehicle to do it. An example, maybe, we may find in the, in the high interest environment that we haven't had for almost a generation, we may find that banks start making super normal profits uh, and we want to adjust the way banks are taxed to, 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 to deal with that. Too, too early to say now. I mean, if you tried designing a tax to deal with that now, you, you risk um, an injustice in taxing them on profits they don't make or you, miss, uh, you risk missing the profit entirely and undertaxing them. So I, I, my boring answer is it's too early to tell. I do think it is worth, Alice, to kind of consider uh, also this kind of the social contract element of it, uh, which sort of also gets indirectly to what you're asking about. That I, I do think there is a, a need for governments right now to very carefully consider how do we avoid coming through these crises with a broken social contract. And I think the tax, uh, tax we tax for many reasons, but we also tax for uh, sort of, um, not just to raise revenue necessarily, but also to strengthen social contract. And there is, a, I think, a sense that um, profiteering do, uh, during this kind of massive uh, crisis situation we're seeing is uh, there is a moral element to that that I think strikes many people as uh, as immoral, and I think we have to recognize the scale of what we're going through right now. Uh, I mean, the World Bank published a report last week. Uh, they said that um, they recorded now the largest increase in inequality since World War II um, during the pandemic. They also say that we've seen the largest increase in recorded extreme per, uh, uh, poverty since 1990. And they say their best guess is that it's most likely also the biggest uh, increase since World War II. They don't have the exact 
uh, sort of data to compare, but that's their best guess. That is the situation we're standing in right now. And I think uh, business needs to recognize the scale of that and the implications for the social contract and uh, accept that there is uh, a need to come through these uh, crises with, uh, without breaking the social contract. And I think uh, recognizing the, the need, for example, for windfall taxes is one of that. And I think we've been very inspired here in Denmark uh, where I'm based, uh, where uh, our largest energy company has actually been out publicly saying, yes, we do recognize that windfall taxes on energy companies might be the right thing to do right now simply because we recognize that we need to also contribute during this moment. And I think that's the right kind of approach we need to see from, from business right now. I think symbolism is important. So, but for, for example, the cut in the mini budget of the, the, the abolition of the 45p top rate is economically almost an irrelevance. It, it's the, the, that top rate brought in 2 billion sterling um, in the context of, I think, overall cuts of, of about 30 billion st sterling per year. So um, that 45p rate, not very important, big picture, but the symbolism of people earning 150,000 pounds getting a tax cut, it, it, it was, I think, inappropriate uh, at, at this point in time. So symbolism is important, but we mustn't make significant decisions and potentially significant wrong decisions because, we, because of symbolism. So creating a windfall tax today based upon our guess as to what the next few months and years are going to bring, and a tax which is potentially distortive, as a 90% profits tax would be, it would be a bad mistake. And another mistake so would be a profits tax, which looks at average profitability in the last four years and said, oh, if you're, if you're making more profit than that, then th th that must be an excess profit, must be a windfall. We, everyone in business knows that you have business cycles, economic cycles, bad years, good years. The result of that would be extremely rough justice. And the taxes like that that were introduced in the first, uh, during the First and Second World War uh, were litigated for decades afterwards but because of the injustice and uncertainty they created. So, so l l let's not do that. Let's design proper windfall taxes, which involve a careful look at windfalls after they're made and are designed around that. I think persuading Westminster to take a long term view of anything right now might be a little difficult, but I, I agree with the principle, Dan. Um, going from higher levels of tax in um, on, on specific industries and, and across the EU in particular to something completely different, tax havens. Are there any that still work? And if they do, are they a good thing, a bad thing, or are they sort of neutral in, in the overall scheme of things? Dan, you want to... Are tax havens good, bad or neutral? Uh, yes, all, all of those. So, uh, yeah, what, 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 what's a bad and an ugly tax haven? A tax haven that lets someone open an offshore account, stick money in there, hide it from their home tax authority, doesn't report it, uh, refuses local tax authority requests for disclosure of who owns the account and how much money in there, uh, that that is ugly tax evasion. In that basic form, that is mostly a thing of the past, thanks to, thanks to the OECD Common Reporting Standards for us, thanks to FATCA for America. But undoubtedly there is still ugly tax evasion going on. So that's the ugly. Um, but bad people still can and do use tax havens as part of tax avoidance transactions, not illegal, but nevertheless undesirable. The, to a degree, pillar two is, is going to kibosh that. Our other disclosure and local rules, um, I like to put more pressure on it. So that's probably a lot of business that has no future. And then, then the neutral funds, joint ventures, people set them up in tax havens because funds and joint ventures shouldn't have an additional layer of tax. And you could probably achieve that in the UK and Germany, say, with a local company, it's just a lot more work. So really those structures, I don't see them as tax avoidance, I see them as tax lawyer avoidance. People are trying to avoid paying large sums to people like me, at least like me a year ago, um, and we'll do it quicker and easier in a tax haven. And I think that's, that, that, that that's fine. I, th I think that's perfectly legitimate use. So we need to be careful to distinguish between the good, the bad, the ugly use of tax havens, make sure that we stop the uses that we don't want, and transparency is a powerful weapon there, um, 
and either don't harm or replace the uses that we think are acceptable. And Christian, just to look at that from a slightly different angle, for the for the developing nations, there are, are actually a number of them who've benefited either from providing much, much better tax rates to external um, taxpayers coming into their country, or no tax rates at all, or in some cases having zones where there are much lower tax rates paid. So is there potential for being a tax haven to be still potential for being a tax haven to be a route to growth and development for developing nations? Well, I think there's a lot of research uh, to kind of show uh, the lack of benefits from these things. And again, this is, I mean, we've been looking into this for many, many years. Uh, I can point to a number of our studies, but I can also point to, to others. Uh, I mean, uh, IMF studies, um, um, there's a joint st uh, statement from IMF, OECD, UN a couple of years ago that basically said that, that um, overall, uh, especially uh, incentives around profits are not, uh, are not really beneficial to most developing countries. Um, and the, the kind of uh, situations you see where a few countries have been able to benefit uh, some by this strategy, it's... Uh, of course, always happening at the expense of other countries. Uh, and that is not a viable uh, development uh, strategy. Uh, so I think we need to, to very much uh, reject the notion that uh, this is a, a, a good or, or, or sustainable development strategy uh, offering uh, low or no taxes. Um, and um, in fact, um, I mean, what Dan is saying that we've kind of, with the common reporting standard, kind of uh, done a lot. Uh, yes, we've done some. I think there's uh, still a lot of data out there that indicates uh, that we're not uh, uh, at the end of that problem for, for a lot of countries. But I think we also have to recognize that just like there's an inequality in this international corporate tax negotiations, that the CRS also has a lot of inequalities built into it. A lot of uh, countries that have the highest share of, uh, uh, of wealth held offshore and that need the money the most, which is primarily developing countries, are not receiving uh, this data from the CRS. And there's a bunch of reasons for that. But uh, basically the progress, a lot of the progress we've been making around tax transparency is still limited uh, to uh, developed countries. And that is really unfair uh, and needs to change. Um, and of course, um, a bunch of countries play a role in this, and, and including the UK itself. So we need to stop uh, the situation whereby uh, the professional sector countries uh, in OECD countries are facilitating uh, tax uh, capital flight from, from developing countries. Um, in terms of the kind of corporate tax havens, uh, the more the aggressive tax planning, we, we do believe that there's still a, a major issues around this. Uh, there was just a new report that came out today around Microsoft. Um, I don't know if anyone has seen it yet. It's, it's, uh, it, it, it looks uh, quite interesting um, and, and points among other things to uh, this kind of structure around uh, Ireland and Bermuda um, and, and kind of reporting um, uh, very high uh, profits uh, that are not taxed in, in Bermuda. Uh, and these is, uh, kind of situations, I, I think most people are fed up with them uh, and can't really understand uh, how that is possible with the current rules. Um, and I think we still, we still have a lot to do to, to, to change that situation. And I don't think we should assume that this uh, OECD Pillar 2 will uh, magically solve all of these uh, uh, problems that are baked into the current system. Uh, we don't, for one, even know if uh, pillar, uh, pillar two will be implemented. Um, so there is a need for a continued focus on tax havens. There is a need for business uh, to show uh, transparency. Uh, the example I mentioned with Microsoft uh, it's, it's very interesting because on the one hand, there's this new story about their, their tax affairs out, uh, but then there's also another story out, which is that they're uh, recommending shareholders not to support an, a shareholder resolution that would require them to be more transparent about their taxes. 
So on the one hand, you have this kind of scandal stories that keep popping up. And then you also have some of the same companies working against transparency and not really providing any meaningful explanation of what's going on. What we get is the usual standard quotes, which is that we follow the rules and regulations and pay our taxes where they're due. Uh, that doesn't really explain uh, then what is going on here. And we need that kind of transparency and we need the private sector to help explain, show what uh, their tax structure is and, 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 and justify it. And I think there are some really good business uh, examples of companies that are able to do some of these things, but we need more companies to do it. Now, I think um, maybe we can come on to ESG in a bit, but tax to a great extent has been the missing part of ESG. If anyone wants to amuse himself, Google ESG and tax, and you will see pages and pages of accounting firms begging, pleading for people to involve tax in ESG and kind of nothing from anyone else. It's it, it has not been really part of the ESG re revolution today. I'm not aware of any ESG funds which have tax as a metric in what they invest in. And ultimately, if the money isn't demanding ESG tax, we, we won't get ESG tax. So there's, there are companies who are, Christian's right, there are some companies who are voluntarily providing a laudable level of transparency. I think Shell is the one that always I I impresses me. Um, other companies could do that. And in a, in a way, I'd rather that we had voluntary tax explanations and disclosure because any statutory requirement is going to be ill-fitting for particular companies and will probably result in disclosure, which is unclear, misleading, not, not that informative a lot of the time. So have, having something which, which is clear, prepared to suit a company's business and done honestly and transparency is really helpful. And if ESG funds and others put pressure on the companies they invest in to adopt those kind of standards, that, that, that would be a good thing. Well, I, don't, I, I, I don't know. If, if anyone in the audience ha has an answer to that, I'd be very interested. Alice, if I may, just one response to what Dan is saying. Yeah, so I think um, the voluntary approach is good in some ways because it means that companies reflect and kind of uh, develop uh, what they think is a meaningful way to do this. But I think we also have to recognize that the incentives in the vo voluntary approach is, uh, uh, is all wrong. So those companies that are most aggressive in their tax practice are also the least likely to be very transparent around their tax affairs. And those companies that already do well uh, and where we might not have big issues are then also the ones that might be more uh, inclined to sort of uh, show and tell everything. And I think what we need to get at is a system where we uh, both have meaningful reporting and that's why we need companies to take a, a stand and sort of uh, work on how can we do this in a meaningful well, way, but we also need legislative requirements so we don't just get reporting from those that are already doing well or have nothing to hide. And that's where the reporting re requirements come in. And there we can ask for basic things that might be difficult to interpret in themselves, uh, but uh, at least bring some transparency, but that needs then to also be uh, sort of uh, massaged and, and explained and uh, companies for them to uh, themselves to provide context for it to be really useful. Uh, and so there's a role for both uh, voluntary but also legislative uh, requirements uh, around that. And then on the institutional investor side, I think, I mean, there's so much happening around this agenda that it might just be a bit difficult to, to sort of Google your way to, to see what is, uh, what is happening. I think there are so many initiatives that are popping up uh, uh, all over the place uh, that it's actually a bit difficult to keep track. We uh, just alone here in Denmark, where I'm based, have had the, uh, an engagement project with the institutional investors over the last five or six years. And we have seen a huge uptake in the responsible tax approach and interest. And we're increasingly seeing institutional investors come together uh, and uh, adopt responsible tax principles that they're requiring now their uh, external asset managers to also follow. Uh, we're seeing this also across numerous countries. There's an uptake. There's these new investor resolutions that I mentioned 
we've had one at Amazon, we're having one at Microsoft and, and more are coming. So I think there is a lot of demand movement. We have also been discussing with asset managers that are uh, interested in developing uh, investment funds uh, where tax is a, a criteria. So I think we're likely to see more on this agenda and there is an interest and demand, but it is also not easy. Uh, and uh, we, we have to, of course, have a dialogue about how to do this. And the business perspective needs to be part of that uh, because we have to find solutions that, uh, that uh, are genuine and that, uh, that really reflect uh, the reality. And tax is not simple. So we need the private sector on board. Yeah, I think the problem with a lot of this stuff is, is that Christian's having conversations with some people at investors and those conversations get watered down at every level. And when they actually do the deals, it, it's completely absent. And certainly that was my experience uh, as an advisor. But the ESG tax is fundamentally not a thing in the commercial world of investing. So, so then just to say... I that, guess that could change. But I think it's a general problem for the ESG agenda, to be honest, across a, a lot of issues that... There's a lot of talk and, and too little action. And, and that's where we have to, of course, also civil society to come in and hold investors resp uh, accountable for their, pro uh, for their actions, not just on tax, but on climate and all other things. But I think it is also fair to say that there is a movement on the way and we are seeing progress. Uh, and we, for one, at Oxfam are, are happy to try to help investors along uh, on this journey towards responsible tax. Uh, and companies as well. So I, d I think that's a really interesting um, set of dichotomy. So we have the voluntary and non-voluntary in the sense of statutory and non-statutory requirements, but we also have non-voluntary in the sense that you have pressure from your external investors and also from your customers and your consumers and the general public. And I wonder to what extent the fact that they are the members of society experiencing the same issues or aware of the same issues everyone else is, it means that the C-suite are making these decisions based purely on their own moral personal views, or do they always need to be experiencing pressure from an external institution, from their customer base, um, from, the, uh, from the government? And if so, is that the correct way of doing things? You know, businesses should be operating in a way that is responsive to what the market and what their, you know, their investors and their different external stakeholders care about, not not necessarily driving everything based on their own personal views. So should they be waiting for that external pressure before they make a move? Well, I think we have, I mean, sorry, the, Dan, go. So maybe to answer that question, we, we need to ask another question, which is where, where do we think there's currently the biggest dichotomy between what business, businesses say their values are and their tax behavior. Uh, these days, I, I think it, it's rarely, if ever, certainly for large companies in what you might call tax avoidance transactions. And it's not very common in sort of transactions, m and and the like. It tends to be in the group structure. It tends to be aspects of the group structure, which, which are created for particular tax results, sometimes perfectly justifiable, but sometimes aggressively, and meaning that countries collect less tax than they probably expect they should. How often do groups say, let's review our group structure and see, are we paying a fair amount of tax in all the countries where we operate? Are there aspects of our group structure which on reflection we think are probably inappropriate? That does not happen to my knowledge. Alex, can I just say, um... I think it's important, just like I was saying, that there's a need to recognize right now at this moment of crisis that there's a need to uh, move our tax systems in a more progressive way. Similarly, I think businesses need to take a wider view of really their interests and their stakeholders, not only seeing them as shareholders, but seeing the kind of what is happening in society. And I think any kind of analysis of that sort right now will lead to the acceptance also that there is a need to really try to be better, try to be more transparent, responsible around tax processes. In this crisis time, there's an expectation on companies to contribute and not to engage in, in, in uh, aggressive tax practices. And I think that uh, it's, it's in the private sector's own uh, interest also to try to 
be uh, transparent, try to explain their track structure, and try to avoid uh, those kind of uh, aggressive uh, tax planning uh, situations. I wonder if there's an element of, of the statutory requirements can be helpful in those circumstances to embarrass companies into changing their behavior if they know they are going to have to reveal things um, and they are on the more aggressive end but they won't necessarily pick up on all of that detail that you want to see so a combination of the voluntary and the statutory may be the way forward um well we're coming to the very very end mm. of the session now so i just wanted to say thank you to dan and to christian for what's been a really really interesting discussion um, we've gone all around the world we've gone into the past and the future and we hope we've given you an overview of how tax could contribute over the next 10 to 15 years um, in, in improving the, the way the world works um, so thank you everyone for your time Excellent. thank you very much have a great day everyone Bye.